Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Tonight we're going to start with the seven sayings from the cross, and we're going to be speaking from Luke. Our primary scripture and verse is going to be from Luke 23 and 34. And it says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they divided his garments and cast lots. But before we get into the word, let's say a brief prayer. Father God, we thank you for tonight, this evening, and we thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence once again and to hear your word. Now let your word uh, fall tenderly on your people's heart, and let us be obedient to your word. These things are many blessings, we pray. Amen. And so, uh, again, Luke 23 and 34, but I want to go back and up to that 23rd and 13 and set the context of what was occurring before we get to the saying where Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In that 13th verse, it is said, And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people, this man being Jesus. And behold, I'm having, I'm having, I having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man. So Pilate didn't find any fault in Jesus, although at this very moment, Jesus was being accused of, of blasphemy. Jesus was being accused of sedition and insurrection. And so he said, I have no, I found no fault in this man, touch, touching those things whereof you accused him, nor, no, nor yet heard, for I sent him I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. And so Pilate had sent him to, to, to Horat, and Horat, he was trying to shake his responsibility. And so he sent him to Horat, and Horat didn't find, King Horat didn't find anything wrong in him, and sent him back to Pilate. And so there's this back and forth with Jesus. They're looking and searching for some wrong in Jesus unable to find it. And so Pilate said, I would chastise him and release him. And so Pilate came to the conclusion, I found no wrong in him. I've sent him to you. You sent him back to me. You found no wrong in him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chastise him and release him. For of a necessity, he must release one of them at the feast. And so the part of the tradition was at the, the, the feast, the festival of the feast, they would have released one person. And so Pilate had decided that Jesus would be the one that would be released. And that 18 verse said, they cried out all at once, saying, away with this man and release us Barnabas. And so Pilate begins to shift his responsibility. No, understand that Pilate was a, a, a rude and a crude governor. But yet in this particular circumstance, he she asked the crowd what he ought to do. In prior circumstances, he had walked in his authority, but now we see him shifting his authority to the people, and that's when they cried out and said, Away with this man and release us, Bournemouth, who for a certain sedition made in the city and, the, and for murder was cast into prison. Now we see Bournemouth <laughs> had seditions, had committed a seditious act and murder, but yet the people were saying, release Barnabas and imprison Jesus. Release the one that we have factual evidence and have proven factual evidence on from prison, and let's imprison the one that we cannot or do not have any factual evidence of any wrongdoing. And so it says in that 20 verse, Der Pilate therefore willing to release Jesus spoke again to them. But they cried out. So Pilate still wanted to release Jesus. But they cried out, right? Because he gave them that authority. He gave them a voice when he didn't have to give them a voice as the governor. He gave them a voice. And they exercised a voice by crying out, crucify him, crucify him. In other words, put Jesus to death. We don't have any facts, but put him to death. Crucify him. And he said unto them the third time. Now here Pilate for the third time. Now he's saying to them, why, why, what evil had he done? He's questioning, the, beginning to question the crowd. Why, what evil have he, Jesus, have done? 
I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. So again, Pilate indicates he's going to uh, chastise Jesus and let him go. And they were insistent with their voice. And they were insistent with their voice, with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. Right? And, and the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. So they cried out again, crucify him. No, let Barnabas go, but the, the seditious murderer, let him go. But Jesus, the innocent one, the one that we don't have any factual evidence, the one who committed no sins, let's crucify him. And their voices prevail <clears throat> uh, with Pilate. And so... And Pilate gave sinners that it should be as they require. And so he gave in to them. So he gave in to fear. He gave in to the masses, the loud voices. He didn't walk in his authority, but he gave his authority away. And then that decision was, wasn't the conclusion that he had to come to. His conclusion was that Jesus had not committed any crime. And so as he released him unto them that for sedition and murder was cast into prison whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. So he released Barnabas, the seditious murderer, and he gave them, delivered Jesus to their will. Their will was what? To crucify him, crucify him. And that 26th verse says, and they led him away and laid upon him, uh, uh, well, I'll stop there on that 25th verse. So that whole uh, chapter of Luke 23, it tells of trials. It tells of punishment, mockery, the beating and the crucifixion of Jesus. If you read that, that's what you're going to see in there. You're going to see a trial. You're going to see a punishment. You're going to see mockery. You're going to see the beating and the crucifixion of Jesus. Because Jesus was brought before Pilate a Roman government for arraignment. He was accused of sedition, right? Originally, they accused him of blasphemy, but blasphemy didn't, didn't uh, align with the Roman uh, understanding, so they changed it from blasphemy to sedition because the Roman understood tradition. And however, Pilate said that he found no fault in Jesus. Therefore, when he said he found no fault in him, he was basically saying he's acquitted. <laughs> the, in other words, the charge you bring for, for him, he's not guilty of. So, but I think it's important that we answer the question, uh, why did Jesus say on, in Luke 23 and 34, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <clears throat> and they divided his garment and cast a lot. But why? 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 Uh, uh, is the question, why did Jesus say, Father, forgive them? I think one of the, the reasons is that Jesus, when he came to earth, he came to earth with a purpose, right? He didn't just come to earth to have fun, come to earth to, he just didn't come to earth to heal and deliver and, set, and, to, and, and just heal people and, and, and open up blind, the blind man's eyes and have the lame walk and raise it. He didn't come to earth just for the miracles. But he came that all humanity, all humans, right, man, woman, child, right, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Puerto Rican, Dominican, he came that, so that all humanity might have their sins washed away and can be reconciled with him and the Father. So he came for reconciliation. He came for the washing away of our sins. He came to forgive us of our sins. As a matter of fact, when you start the Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us our sins, right? It's a constant reminder that we need to ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins. And so Jesus said, Father, forgive them because he was aware of that every person, every human in his own time would have a chance to fully repent and receive eternal life. We all have an uh, opportunity. And even right now, if we don't know Christ, we have an opportunity to, to repent and ask the Lord 
to forgive us and receive eternal life. In Hebrews 3 and 15, it says, while it is said today, if you hear, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as rebellion. See, Jesus came to save. He came to save. And while he was saving, he did miracles. He healed and he he did other things with the lame and, and with the demon possessed. But his main purpose was to save, to provide salvation, to reconcile man back with the Father. It's all about reconciliation and salvation. And Jesus was aware of what he must do, and he was aware about his Father business. You and I need to be aware about the Father's business. And so he said, Father, forgive them. Them. Who are the them, right? So we are the them. Uh, and so when he was crucified, you know, when Jesus was crucified between the two thieves, as he hung on the cross and, you know, while he was hanging there, he was being insulted, right? He was being abused and and, and, and poked and made fun of and all sorts by all sorts of men and they and, and and put he was put to this greatest pain that was the point of his greatest pain and his torture and what did he do he addressed the father because he knew his business he knew why he was there and it was about his father's business which was about bringing reconciliation to us right his attitude and his behavior in the darkest hours, hours of his life, serve as our best example. For when we face, right, when we face harsh treatment for others, Jesus on that cross between the two thieves served as a model, served as an example for us. This is where forgiveness came in. It came in. Right? What if forgiveness came in? It came in on the cross, right? <laughs> Jesus looked up and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right? It came on the cross. And so you didn't hear, you didn't hear Jesus cussing. You didn't hear him fussing. He remained focused on the task and the assignment that he had been given. You and I are going to have to remain focused on the task and the assignment that we have been given. We have to have a spirit in order to do this walk, in order to, to remain focused, we're going to have to have a spirit of forgiveness, right? we got to be focused on what is most important, right? And so Jesus was focused on what was most important and why he came to earth. He came to give humanity, right? to wash away our sins, and so that we can be reconciled back to, to, to the Father. That's why he was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You can't, we cannot be reconciled back to the Father without forgiveness of our sins. <laughs> so we have to be forgiven for our sins in order for us to be reconciled back in relationship with the Father. And Jesus was essential, played the essential role, right? He was the, if it was a movie, he was the, the main star. He was the star actor, right? And without him, there is no forgiveness of our sins. And so Jesus stayed focused on why he was, he came here, and he, even though he was being crucified on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He knew the sinfulness of a human heart, right? Jesus knew that human heart is sinful, right? And we're, our heart is de desperately wicked. He also knew that the Father plan required his death and resurrection. So he knew these things. You remember when Jesus said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Well, he said that because he knew he had to go this route, right? But but if it's thy will, he was not, I'm not quoting the Vader, but if it's, if it's your will, I, let it be done. Jesus said, but if, if this is the way I must go, then and if it's your will, I will do it, right? 
not my will. Jesus said, well, my will is, well, well God, I think I, I think there's another way to do it. We got to be careful that we, gonna, we don't try to tell Jesus how to do it, right? And so he also knew no sin. He also, he who knew no sin uh, was about to take on the sins of the world, right? At the same moment he was asking the Father to forgive us, he was innocent. Remember Pilate said, I, I don't see no fault in it, right? So he was sinless. So he who knew no sin, he didn't know no sin, but he's asking for forgiveness of our sins, was about to take on the sin of the entire world, right? So if you're in the world, he took on our sin. In other words, he paid a debt that you and I couldn't pay. Woo, hallelujah. He paid a debt, right? We didn't, we didn't ask for it. We didn't know we needed it, but he paid that debt on our behalf. Past sin, current sin, and future sin. Not a reason to sin, but he paid the debt in the past, in the present, and in the future, right? And he asked the Father, forgive them their sin, for they know not what they do. So prior to forgiving those uh, who were crucified him unjustly, right? He took on that sin for the whole world, and yet we crucified him. So Jesus taught the disciples, what did he teach the disciples? He taught disciples to, to love their enemies and to pray for their enemies, for those who abuse them. That's Luke 6 and 27 and 28. Here you see Jesus practicing and modeling what he preached. Let's look at that. If you go to that, uh, Luke 26, uh, 27. And 28, Luke 6, but it says, but I say unto you, but I say unto you which hear, love your enemy, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. <laughs> How are you going to do that? You're going to have to have a forgiving spirit, right? You're going to have a, a spirit of forgiveness operating in you. You ain't going to be able to do that in yourself. The only way you're going to be able to do that for those who are despitefully using you, the only way you're going to be able to do that for your enemies is that you have a relationship with the Father. But here we see Jesus being crucified, right? Being mocked, right? Being tormented at his darkest hour, yet Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, right? So he's modeling, he's practicing what he is preaching. And you and I, if we're going to uh, follow Jesus, we have to model and practice who we say we love and what we're preaching, right? So we're reminded that the events of our own lives do not surprise God either. And so we must Trust him. And we heard that this morning in Sunday, sir. I mean, in Sunday last, last Sunday's service, we must trust him to help us respond and, and love when we are confronted by the challenges we face. We got to trust God because we're going to face some challenges in this life, right? And we got to trust God when we're facing those challenges to confront those challenges with a what? Forgiving spirit. We have to model it just like Jesus modeled it. You know, I, I don't think we, none of us will be crucified, uh, not any, hopefully not anytime soon, if, if, if at all. But whatever challenge face us, we have to practice forgiveness, right? And so, so if we're going to follow Jesus, we must practice who and what we say we believe in. All right, we got to walk, we got to walk the talk. And so they crucified Jesus. There were there with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left, right? Jesus was hung between two criminals, one on his right hand and one on his left hand. You know, crucifixion at that time was used to degrade and to belittle, right? It, it, it strips a person of the honor and permits uh, people to abuse them, right? You remember people was abusing Jesus? It's, it's, it was the ultimate punishment reserved by Rome for the worst offenders 
of that day. You know, even today, we got the ultimate punishment is the death sentence, right? So that's the ultimate, even today, that is the ultimate punishment, the death sentence. But so it was, a, it was the same thing back then, but it was by crucifixion. Today, it might be by lethal injection, right? They outlawed electrocution, but it's by lethal injection. But back then, it, it was by crucifixion, right? Uh, remember what Pilate said, though. Having examined him, Jesus, in, he, now I said, I don't, not only did I examine him, but I examined him in your presence. I examined Jesus to see if he was guilty of what you claim he did in your presence. In other words, it was transparent for all to see. And then Pilate said, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things in which you accuse him. <laughs> Yet, here Jesus is being crucified between two criminals, one on the right and one on the left. But Pilate is also saying, I haven't found anything in him. So why is Jesus hanging on the cross? So throughout Jesus' ministry, Jesus always identified with sinners. And, and so uh, whether that been with the people in the crowds that he hung out with and at the, at the beginning or to a prostitute. Remember the prostitute? The, uh, the, the prostitute and Jesus said, go. He said, you got multiple husbands. Jesus said, go and sin no more, right? Uh, or at the end of the story, you find, we find Jesus again with two sinners, right? Jesus was always because the sinners are the one who needed salvation, right? The sinners are the one who needed saving. I'm thankful that Jesus engaged with sinners because you and I were once a sinner, and Jesus engaged with us. And here, now that Jesus is being crucified, once again, Jesus is in the company of two sinners because his purpose was to save people and to reveal the truth to a lost humanity, right? And so, as a, <clears throat> not by force, uh, you know, he wouldn't, uh, in terms of being crucified, it wasn't by force. For scripture says, I mean, in terms of Jesus uh, providing salvation, it's not by force, but for scripture says, by love and kindness have I drawn thee. That's how Jesus was. By love and kindness. And that's why it's important as believers, we have to demonstrate, model, love and kindness, the love and kindness of Jesus. For whom is Jesus praying? Now, Jesus said, Father, forgive them if they know what, not what they do. Who is he praying when he said, Father, forgive them? Most likely, he's praying, his prayer includes not only the soldiers, right? Because <laughs> those he's certainly praying for the one who's crucifying him, who inflicting wounds upon him, who's... Uh, uh, who's mocking him, but also the Jewish leaders who uh, uh, instigated the crucifixion. So, see, Jesus, he, he has no respected person. He's not just praying for certain people, but he's praying for all humanity, right, all life soul. That, that's a model for us. We got to make sure our prayer is much broader in terms of not only praying for a certain kind of person or a certain person, but there's many people that need to know Jesus. And we need to be praying for every soul that don't know Jesus, every soul that haven't asked for forgiveness. So uh, the crowd, he's praying for the crowd that demanded, right? He, he praying for the crowd that demanded, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus is praying for them. <laughs> That's what forgiveness looked like. Those that will spitefully use you and abuse you. Jesus praying for the one who said, crucify him, crucify him. I don't know if I'm there yet. <laughs> you might be, but I don't know if I'm there yet. Somebody, somebody crucifying me. I don't know. I'm not sure I'm ready to say, well, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. But I'm working towards that direction. And, he, and the disciples, he was praying for the disciples. What happened to the disciples? What happened in the story when, was, when Jesus was being arrested and being crucified? The disciples were nowhere to be found. <laughs> Perhaps even Judas. You know, Judas, right? 
turned them in. He sold them out, right? He uh, uh, betrayed him, right? And, then, and if you look at that 49th verse of Luke uh, 23, I believe it was Luke 23 and 49. Let's look at that one. It says, and all his acquaintances and the woman that followed him, the Gentiles, stood afar off, beholding these things. You see that? So, so except for the woman standing there, that's a woman standing at a distance, right? So Jesus' prayer does not mean that, that Israel will not pay a price for his evil deed. Jesus had already wept for Israel in that 19th verse, uh, 40 that 19th chapter, 41 through 44, and he had foretold the destruction of the temple, right? That was some of the, some of the allegations, right, they had against Jesus in Jerusalem. But his purpose was to save rather than curse. See, Jesus' whole purpose was to save. Yes, he did miracles. Yes, he prayed for the lame and they walked. Yes, he opened up the eyes of the blind. Yes, he raised the dead. Yes, he prayed for the woman with the issue of blood. Yes, and yes, and yes. But his main purpose was to save soul. His desire that every man, woman, and child come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's his main purpose. His death provide his death and his resurrection provide salvation to all who will accept his grace and his mercy and this offering that he provided. Now, let's talk a little bit about the dividing of the garment. And it said, and they were, uh, he said, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Divide, and then they began to divide his garment uh, uh, among themselves, and they cast lots. Now, that Psalms, over in Psalms 22, talks about the suffering praise and posterity of the Messiah. But specifically in Psalms 22 and 18, which states, they divided, it said, they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothes they cast lots. <laughs> now Jesus being crucified, here they are, uh, down there throwing rocks for his clothes, right? Who gets what? Who gets the robe? Who who gets the, the, the belt? Who they, they trying to figure out who gets his clothes? Uh, the stripping, you know, stripping prisoners of their clothes degrade them. Because when you strip people, they what? They naked, right? It's a, it's a form of degrading people. It emphasizes the totality of his shame before a public out. Now, so now the stripping of clothes, now you got a, a crucified body up high. So everybody can see up close, but from afar, butt naked, right? Beaten and blooded and butt na naked, right? Abused and mocked and spit on, tired and weary, butt naked, that you can see up close and afar off. So they were stripping his clothes. And so even today, they do some of the same thing when you go into prison. They strip you, right? They call it strip search, right? Have you squat down and call. They script searching you. It's a, it's a form of taking of one's dignity, letting you know that you don't have any say in what happens here. You don't have any say what time get up, you get up, what time you eat. We, you are now wards of the state. So it's a way of bringing you into submission. And that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to bring Jesus into submission because he had said, I am the son of man, right? And they call that they call it blasphemy, but they was but they was bringing him to the Roman soldiers uh, and others under the term of sedition because because of the understanding of the words right across those different uh, uh, groups there. So, uh, but we know that at any moment, here's what we know: at any moment, not not just then, but right now, any moment, Jesus could have called a legion of angels to resolve. All the conflict. <laughs> but guess what? He didn't do it. Why didn't he do it? He stayed with the Father's redemptive plan, right? It was about redeeming that which was once lost. 
<laughs> Somebody ain't hearing me. They don't like my teaching, Brother Jeremy. It was about redeeming you and I. It was about us. He did it for, let me bring it even narrower. He did it for you. He did it for me. You can point back to yourself. He did it. And if I and you were the only one, he still would have stayed with the plan. <laughs> That's why today I'll tell you, you got to stick with the plan. What plan? The plan of the Bible. The plan of the word of God. Stick with the plan. Regardless of how cold it gets, regardless of what pandemic's going on, regardless of what insurrection going on in the Capitol, in the White House, you got to stick with the plan of God. Huh. So, although Jesus' clothes may have been stripped, guess what? His authority was never stripped. He never, no one took his authority. They crucified him, but they didn't take his authority. They took his clothes, but they didn't take his authority. He willingly laid down his life. If he chose not to, angels would have busted on the scene. <laughs> and they weren't coming to play harps. They would have been coming to, to slash, slash, slash some heads off because they have authority and we've been operating under the authority of Jesus. But Jesus stayed with the plan. He knew why he had came, and he stayed with the Father's redemptive plan. You and I got to stay with the Father's plan. The Father have a plan for you and I. And so for these soldiers, you know, they were just doing what they normally do. Guess what they don't do? They hang people up on cross, and they kill them. They kill them. But, but that day, that day would change the world. That was a day that changed the world. You know, the enemy meant it for, for evil, but God had a way of turning things around. That day changed things, right? And, but the, the soldiers missed the importance and the significance of what they was doing. So once they horsed him up on the cross and in place, they, they, they had a long wait because he wasn't dead because they had nailed him in his hands and his feet and pierced him in his side, but he wasn't dead, so the blood had to drain, right, until he gave up the ghost, right? So they had some time on their hand. They were doing what they normally do, but they had some time on it. He wasn't, Jesus, when they raised the cross up, Jesus wasn't dead. <laughs> so what did they do? How did they feel their time? They began to cast lots, right? They began to gamble to see who would win Jesus' clothes. But see, this was just a momentary diversion, right? They, they, again, they didn't understand the context of the big picture. You and I got to see the big picture. You ain't seeing the big picture by, big picture by watching the news. You're going to see the big picture by getting in God's words and embracing God's words as the truth, right? And so earlier, a woman with, remember the woman with the issue of blood? She had touched Jesus' garment. His clothes, the same clothes, same clothes that they were casting lots over, a woman with issue of blood was saying, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I would be made whole. <laughs> now, you got soldiers gambling over that garment. And so in the instant, she received healing because she, and Jesus said, well, who touched me? I felt my virtue going out of my body. And so what a woman saw power, see, the woman saw power in his garments. Right? The soldiers now only see a pile of dirty clothes worth at best a few coins that they can sell or whatever. See, we got to be careful just like the soldiers because often, uh, how often we focus on trivial things. The soldiers will focus on trivial things and they miss the great things happening around them. We too can miss the great things that's happening around us. We have to stay in the word because God is revealing himself to us in his words. He's revealing himself to us in the elements. He's revealing us, himself through us by the things that's happening in his world. We got to see the big picture. And that's why we got to stay in God's word so he can reveal to us. And so during this recent storm, many of us may have missed the great things that were happening around us, just like the soldiers. Because even though it was 10, 15 big leagues, 15 degrees below with the wind chill, Jesus didn't stop being Jesus. Just because your power went out, Jesus didn't lose power. He still has power. Holy Ghost power. Uh, just because there wasn't no food in the store and you had to boil water, Jesus didn't stop being Jesus. He was still Jesus. And so 
we was well, we was so focused in and locked in, uh, and we couldn't work right. But it was an opportunity to be alone with the Lord, right? Even though we couldn't go to work, even though we had, we had an opportunity to be alone with the Lord. I ain't have time to pray. I ain't have time to read my Bible. Well, now you had time to seek the Lord face, to fast and to pray. We had an opportunity during this storm, uh, yet many of us chose to only focus on the negative. All right. <laughs> Even though the storm was bad, there is still beneath Jesus. We can be thankful that Jesus is still in control. Jesus still has authority. And so there was other soldiers who uh, uh, related differently to Jesus in the gospel. There's always going to be someone who will serve and believe in the Lord, even if we don't. <laughs> so just because you don't want to serve the Lord, just because you don't believe in the Lord, there's all, God always going to have somebody that will serve him. In chapter 7, the, the centurion faith exceeded anything that Jesus had found in Israel. At the conclusion of the crucifixion, another centurion will praise God and proclaim, uh, certainly, this was a righteous man. I believe that verse 47 you look at Luke 23 and verse 1, it says, Now the centurion saw what was done. He glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. This is after they put him, to, put, they had crucified him. So you see, the soldier had some down there casting, gambling for his clothes. Then you had some saying, No, oh, this truly was a righteous man. Pilate even said he was a righteous man. He find no fault in him. But Pilate stepped out of his role. He gave his authority to the crowd. And the crowd said, crucify, crucify. And Pilate tried several times and said, no, he, he, there's, there's no crime in him. But they said, crucify, crucify, and release Barnabas, this murderous seditionist. <laughs> stay, in your, stay in your position. That's why it's important that we stay in our position. Stay in the position. Operate under the authority in which Christ has given you. Pilate wasn't operating in his authority. He gave his authority to the crowd. Then the crowd ended up telling him what to do, even though he knew Jesus. He knew Jesus was innocent. And because of the volume of the crowd and the noise of the crowd, he surrendered to the crowd's voice. So whom do you see Jesus as today? Right? The woman of issue of blood saw him as, uh, if she could touch the hem of his garment, that there was power in him. So there's people, even today, people see Jesus all kind of way. But who do you see Jesus as today? Everybody don't see him the same or see him the way that you do. Just as the soldiers saw him different ways. Just as a woman with the issue of blood saw him a, a different way. We need to make sure that we have an accurate truth about who Jesus is based on his word. <laughs> you hear that? Based on his word, not based on what you think and what you feel and what grandma and papa told you, but based on his word, we need to have an accurate description of who Jesus is in our lives. And once we do decide to serve, we serve him in truth, right? So there was three groups that taunted Jesus, right? You can look at that 35th verse, that 35th verse. It talks about those three groups. The 35th through 39th verse of Luke 23, it talks about the three groups, right? The rulers with them also scoffed at him. Talk about the rulers. The soldiers, they also mocked him. One of the criminals, remember, one of the criminals hanging on the side of Jesus. One, you know, Jesus always hung out with the sinners. Why? Because they need to be saved. But one of them mocked him. What did the other one say? Rem the other one said, remember me. Right? And Jesus said, in this day, you're going to be in paradise. But the other one, uh, he, 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 didn't, he was, he was kind of uh, taunting Jesus. Because, see, here's the thing. If Jesus is the Messiah and his mission is to save, right, how can he save the people if he cannot save himself, right? Now, there's an irony to that. The salvation for which they was clamoring or they were claiming for, they was, well, Jesus, you Save yourself. Well, that's temporal, right? The salvation which Jesus was proclaiming is eternal. He's talking about eternal salvation. 
The cross is a, well, well, how do you get salvation? The cross is the avenue, the conduit, the road in which the Father has defined that, that salvation would come. It's through the cross, right? And so if Jesus was to save himself, this is the irony of it. If Jesus was to save himself, it was, if you be king, save yourself and save what? Jesus could have said, if I save myself, fool, I'm going to abort salvation, the ministry. I can save myself, but if doing so is at the expense of the world. If I save myself, the world will not ha have access to be reconciled back to the Father. So Jesus couldn't, even though he had all authority, he had all power. He could have called legion angels. He could have came down off that cross. But if he had, you and I would be lost. So God in his mercies, he looked down and saw Sister Jesse. Right? He looked down and saw Brother Gerald. He saw you, whatever your name is. And so he said, I'm going to stay on this cross. Right? Right? so that you and I can have access once again back to the Father. You know, and he looked to the uh, repentant criminal, and he saves him, right? Now, the three taunts echoes, those three taunts are similar, or it echoes the three temptations or the uh, 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 points, uh, temptation of Jesus, the devil said. Remember the devil, when he took Jesus up in that fourth, uh, Luke 4, 1 to 13, he said, if you the son of God, command these stones be made to bread. <laughs> it was all throughout the gospel, people were tempting Jesus, right? Then he said, if you therefore will worship before me, it, it, it'll all be yours. Then finally the devil said, if you are the son of God, cast yourself down here. <laughs> but Jesus being Jesus and being able to see what spirit not just listening to the word, but looking into the spirit realm, operating the spirit realm, seeing the spirit behind these things, he didn't fall for the temptation. Neither did he come off that cross, because to come off that cross would doom all of us, right? Now, the leaders say, let him save himself if this is the Christ of God, if he's a chosen one. The soldiers say, if he's the king of the Jews, save yourself. The criminals say, if you're Christ, save yourself in us. <laughs> so they're all mocking Jesus. If you, if you are, if you are. Now, in other words, I don't believe, but prove it to me. And so each of those six challenges tip, tempt Jesus to prove that he is the Messiah. We don't need to get caught up in looking for signs. Prove you, Jesus, give me a new car. Prove you, Jesus, give me a new house. The Bible says it's just to live by what? Faith, not signs and wonders, although they are part of it, but we live by faith in his word. And Jesus is tempted to use his power for selfish purposes instead of servant purposes. He used his power, his authority, for servant purposes. He said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. Once again, he's modeling out the scripture for us. He's practicing walking the talk. I'm a serve. Serving required me to stay up on this cross. Selfishness, I ain't going to be, nail, you want to nail me? Selfishness would have required him to come off the cross. But servanthood required him to stay on the cross. And as a result of him being a servant, you and I now have access to the kingdom of God if we ask for forgiveness. <laughs> he forgave us, but we still got to ask for forgiveness. Lord, forgive me for I have sinned against thee, right? We got to confess, believe, and receive the salvation, the gift of mercy that he provided. And so we, too, are tempted to question Jesus' kingship. We can be we question we can question Jesus if Jesus is king. If Jesus is king, why is Jesus allowing this to happen? Why is Jesus allowing my house to be without power for three days? Why is Jesus allowing my mama to die? I prayed and I believed Jesus for her, but she, she died anyway. We all probably didn't been there. We all have questioned Jesus at some point. 
we can just keep living for him, keep believing in him, and when you get to heaven, he'll give you that answer. And so we're we're kind of we're kind of you know Jesus died and was went to the cross and resurrected, and now we're waiting on his final return, and we're kind of in between those two. The resurrection have happened, but Jesus' final return, victorious turn, haven't happened. So where did that put us? That put us in the between. We're in the interim. We're in between those two points, right? The, his resurrection and his final return. And while we're waiting, we're to follow his command. We're to align with his word. We're to keep the faith until he returns. John 14 and 3 says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming again and will take you to myself. So that where I am, there you will be, also be. So Jesus, in this interim, while we're in this interim, we're to maintain, we're to, to walk this gospel out, right? We're to model and practice this gospel just as Jesus did. We're to, to operate with, with a spirit of forgiveness. I know it's hard to forgive sometimes. But y'all know what they did to me. But I know what Jesus did for you. <laughs> I don't know what they did, but I know what Jesus did. He forgave you of your sins. Now let's talk about your sins. Jesus forgave you. He forgave the whole world. He took on the sins of the whole world. So while we wait for Jesus, while we wait, Jesus said we should not expect life to be easy. In John 16, 33, he says, I have told you these things that in me you may have peace. Jesus he wants us to have peace. I'm telling you so you can have peace. But he said, in this world you will have trouble. You will have trouble. But he said, take heart. In other words, just, just listen to what I'm saying. I have overcome the world. And if he's overcome the world and we are in him and he's in us, then we are overcoming the world. Not by man's metrics, but by spiritual met met metrics, by godly metrics. And Luke 23 and 34 is part of that confirmation. Right? It's, it's all part of that confirmation. And what he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garment and cast lots. We have to operate with a spirit of forgiveness. Jesus has forgiven us. Now we have that same responsibility to forgive others. And as we pray the Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us our sins, right? We have to forgive. And you can't do it in yourself, but you can do it only in the spirit of God. May God have a blessing on the reading of the word, and may he keep you and hold you until next time. God bless you.